But uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. And uh, thanks to Ishita in particular, um, met her through the New York Academy of Sciences. Um, highly recommend anyone uh, getting involved in their mentoring programs, they're really great. And so yeah, I'm just gonna take a little bit about my experience um, in my professional journey, and hopefully it will inspire all of you <laughs> to uh, also become scientists. Yeah, so the title of this presentation is The Life of a Young Scientist from Central New York to New York City and beyond. So my career trajectory uh, has been a long one. I'm probably about 10 to 15 years older than most of you on this call. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I grew up in CNY, so that's uh, short for Central New York. So uh, suburbs of Syracuse, and I went to high school there, uh, go Hornets. So I went to Fayette Manley's High School, and uh, then I went off to college in the Hudson Valley, so at Marist College. So it's about, um, it's in Poughkeepsie, so it's about halfway between Albany and New York City. Uh, right on the Hudson River. And then I uh, went back to CNY for graduate school where I got my PhD at Syracuse University. And then after that, went to New York City, so back downstate, <laughs> and did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And recently, I just got a new job at a contract research organization called Invigro. So it's a Boston-based company, but uh, I actually work remotely. So um, all the study directors now actually work remotely because of COVID. And I think it's actually going to be the business model moving forward. But uh, the beginning of my journey really started with, you know, a wise man once said, go to grad school, they pay you. <laughs> so my high school chemistry teacher basically told me that, you know, if you go to graduate school, uh, you don't have to pay for it if you're pursuing a life sciences or hard sciences PhD and they actually pay you. So I'll get into a little bit of what that exactly means because that might be a foreign concept to many of you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wanna talk about a little bit what I do. Um, so the STEAM, the S stands for science and the field that I work in is called molecular imaging. So I just wanted to define that a little bit. Um, it's a type of medical imaging that provides detailed pictures of what's happening inside the body at both the molecular and the cellular level. So. Many of you have probably heard of, or maybe you've even gotten diagnostic imaging procedures. So if you've ever gotten like an X-ray or a commut computed tomography, a CT, um, and even an ultrasound, you know, the uh, kind of the imaging procedure that everybody undergoes um, when they're pregnant. So that offers pictures of physical structure, um, but it doesn't really give you what's happening to the biology. Molecular imaging allows physicians to see how the body's functioning and measure its chemical and biological processes in a more specific way. So the molecular imaging that I work on includes the field of nuclear medicine, which uses very small amounts of radioactive materials known as radiopharmaceuticals to both diagnose and to treat disease. So what that means is basically to do um, molecular imaging in the sense of nuclear medicine is patients will get injected with a small amount of radioactivity and that molecule will uh, basically go to the site of disease. So it, you can, uh, it'll light up and you'll be able to detect it using these special types of cameras that work with computers and they provide really precise pictures of the area and the body being imaged. Um, nuclear medicine can also be used to treat certain types of cancer and other diseases. So um, not only are there radionuclides that are used for diagnostics um, in the field of molecular imaging, but there are also radionuclides that can be used for therapeutic purposes as well. So um, many of you might not know what nuclear medicine really is, but if anyone's ever heard of a PET scan, <laughs> that's basically um, what I'm talking about. So in the sense of if you know anybody that's got a PET scan, chances are they've been injected with uh, basically what's called radioactive glucose. So this is an example of that. <laughs> so there's two really common types of PET scans. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the different things that I do. Um, but this is an example of a 75 year old uh, prostate cancer patient. Um, and in the first panel on the left, he was injected with uh, radioactive glucose. So basically what that means um, is they radio label um, a glucose molecule and they inject it. And where it'll go is sites of um, high metabolic activity. So places where a lot of sugar is being taken up in the body. And oftentimes that can be uh, the site of disease and the site of, in this case, cancer. Um, and another type of uh, common PET scan is known as a, a bone scan. So that's where you just inject like basically free um, radioactive fluorine and that will show intense radio tracer uptake in bone lesions um, because it will uh, go directly to the bone. 
Um, and if you combine those two techniques, you can actually, which is shown in the panel on the right and see, uh, you can see both lesions which are marked by the arrows here. Um, and so this will show both uh, cancerous and osseous or skeletal uh, lesions using these two forms of PET. So the stuff that I work on is a little bit different, um, still uses radioactivity, still called radiopharmaceuticals, but it's more um, targeted to different uh, proteins within the body. Um, so basically a lot of things, a lot of times what will happen in cancer is, um, you know, you get like an overgrowth of like uncontrollable cellular division, right? And with that uncontrolled cellular division, you can get an overexpression or a high activity of these specific types of proteins that you can target on the surface of um, cells. So what I'm showing here is basically if you have a low activity, and this is one of the targets that I worked on during my postdoctoral fellowship, if you have low MYC activity and low transferrin receptor expression, you could, will have a low signal on the PET scan. But in the context of cancer, where you're having an uncontrollable cell division, you're going to have a higher activity, higher expression, and therefore you're going to get more of that targeted signal at the site of disease. And you can use that to, to diagnose and like visualize that within the body. So this is a good example. One of the first projects that I worked on um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering was actually comparing that traditional tracer that I showed you in the first slide. So using that radio label glucose versus one of my targeted tracers. And this is showing that my targeted tracer actually works better. So basically this is kind of a busy figure. So apologies for that. Uh, but what you can see here is that on the top, um, so on the left, we have one uh, cancer model, and then on the right is another uh, cancer model. On the top two images is my targeted tracer, and on the bottom is uh, the radioactive glucose. So what you're seeing here is basically there's a lot more uptake of that targeted tracer. So the radio labeled tracer in each of these types of um, cancer models, right, compared to the FDG. See how like we're, I'm pointing to the same side. This is the same exact mice, by the way. <laughs> so these are just imaged at different times um, in order for like allowing the tracer to decay during at different times. But basically what you're seeing here is you're not seeing super targeted uptake and you can see a lot of background uptake kind of like in the muscle and then in the, you know, the excretion pathways and things like that. Um, and in the liver in this mouse in this case, um, so what you're seeing here, so this is actually like an image of a mouse that I, I did this scan, and this is the head and this is the tail. Um, so what you're seeing here um, are actually like tumored animals. And um, the, the whole point of the study is to show that there are better tracers than what is generally accepted as like our clinical gold standard. Um, and you can see here that this is actually quantitative, part, which is particularly important actually in the tumor. So we can see that the uh, targeted tracer does have higher uptake than our fluorinated glucose. So another way um, that I actually use molecular imaging um, is not just to diagnose disease, but to also actually assess drug response and therapy. So this can be important because um, when you're working with targeted radiopharmaceuticals, um, so a lot of the drugs that are out there might be targeting a like specific protein of interest. So what you would be looking for is basically you're gonna see that uptake of your tracer in the beginning, but as you go along and drug patients, or in this case, animals, you can see that there might be a significant decrease of that tracer uptake. And that's showing that, you know, we're assessing our target of interest and we're decreasing the uptake of that uh, protein because the treatment is actually working. So you can see this in a number of different models here. Um, whereas actually here on the left, you can see that in this particular model, so again, these are mice that I imaged, this is the head, this is the tail. You can see that the drug's not really working here, right? You can see that this is the uptake in the tumor um, and these are implanted on the hips of the mice. Um, so what you're seeing is that th this doesn't really work here. And this is, you can tell by the quantitation down below that there's really no significant differences, right? But in the middle, you can see clearly that, you know, we're pointing same kind of tumors, great uptake in our um, non-drug treated, but in our drug treated mice, you see significantly lower uptake. And then finally on the right, you see sort of like a medium responder, right? So it's still significant, but it's not as apparent because you can see that the, the color change in the uptake is really not that different, but it is slightly lower in the drug treated animals, which are shown on the right. Um, so this is, you know, another key way that molecular imaging can help us um, to not only diagnose disease, but to also 
you know, show us if a particular therapy is actually working. So um, another study that I wanted to show you just to give you sort of more of an idea of what I do um, extends beyond, you know, the cancer space in oncology. Um, and this is actually, this is a really cool tracer because it doesn't actually target a particular type of uh, protein or specific, you know, target that's on the surface of cancer cells, but it's actually will target acidity. Um, so what I'm showing here um, is we induced a model of acidosis in these mice. And basically what happens is these tracers, once they get protonated in this acidic environment, and when this pH lowers, so this can be at the site of uh, multiple diseases. And in this case, it's a model of sepsis, right? So um, sepsis can be really acidic here. And what is showing is basically once these, this tracer gets protonated, it actually inserts itself into the cellular membrane, which is kind of what I'm showing here. And so basically, um, what we're showing is that this is the timeline. So once you induce that sepsis by injecting this toxin, you know, three hours later, we can inject our radio tracer, which is shown here. And then um, one in four hours post that radio tracer injection, we can image those mice and basically assess that uptake over time. Um, and what we're looking at is basically uh, peripheral uptake. So throughout the whole body, um, but also more particularly is that um, difference in acidity in the actual brain. Um, so uh, that's something that I'm gonna show you on the next slide because I think it looks pretty cool. And it's a little bit more clear when you're actually looking at brain slices. Um, but this is a different form of imaging. It's called autoradiography. So basically what these are, are sort of um, exposed brain slices. <laughs> so this is like that you can also, um, you can do focused PET imaging on the brain as well, but this is actually um, brains that were resected um, from these animals. And you can see that in the, in the septic mice, there's a lot more uptake of our tracer. Um, so this is targeting acidity in the brain. And it's really cool because this is actually tied, you know, we, we were able to show in this study that it was actually specifically tied to neuroinflammation as well. Um, so this is just a, a couple of the examples of, you know, molecular imaging that I've worked on um, and basically showing uh, how you can use it for diagnostics um, inside and outside the oncology space and also using it to assess drug treatment. And, you know, this is something that uh, might, could be worked on in the future in terms of looking at different kinds of treatments for sepsis and seeing if we can, you know, non-invasively detect those different changes. So I want to bring it back <laughs> to my career trajectory because I just slammed you all with a lot of science uh, and basically uh, kind of maybe walk you through some of the steps <laughs> that I took to, to get to where I am today. Because, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I've, I'm quite a bit further ahead in my professional journey. Um, and, and I wanna make sure that, you know, I can actually give you sound advice. <laughs> uh, um, Cause I think the audience here is, is mostly high schoolers. Yeah. So I work for, um, as I mentioned, a contract research organization. So uh, it's a company called Invigro. And so basically, you know, the question is what's a CRO? It's a company that provides support to the uh, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and medical device industries. Um, it comes in the form of research services, which are outsourced on a contract basis. So the difference between um, like a CRO and big pharma is we often have big pharma as our sponsors. So a sponsor is like an example of a outside company or potentially an academic institution, they'll come to us because we're the experts in molecular imaging. And what we'll do is we'll help design and execute preclinical studies of radiopharmaceuticals. The company that I work for also does clinical studies as well. Um, however, I'm not currently involved in that. So that's not what I'm going to talk about today. And basically my job as a study director is I'm the person that is sponsor facing. So I have the interaction um, to with the sponsor directly and I ensure all the teams um, are able to work synergistically. So um, kind of managing the lab team and the imaging analysis team and the study managers and making sure that everything gets done like on time and in a, in, you know, a reasonable time window as well um, and making sure everything is done correctly. So basically I'm kind of responsible as the last set of eyes, for example, that you know, sees the data before it goes to the sponsor. So a day in the life <laughs> of a study director, um, lots of meetings. <laughs> uh, so basically, you know, we're meetings, meetings, meetings uh, to plan the logistics of experiments, um, figuring out the costs of studies, things like that. So basically um, I'm the type of person, it's my responsibility if I have a call with like a new sponsor, I have to draft a quote um, to make sure that, you know, 
we are actually uh, charging that sponsor the appropriate time for all the materials, all the labor, all the analysis, the report generation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, again, I am the sponsor facing person. So I am the one that's on the calls. Um, I'm the one that has to ultimately present the data uh, and also navigate all the logistics versus the expectations. Um, I do a lot of writing, which um, as many of you may find to, to discover one day in science, this is kind of what the job becomes. <laughs> so, you know, I used to write papers. Now I write data reports. Uh, I, you know, I draft study protocols and of course, as I mentioned before, quotes to, to price out studies. And then, you know, uh, another thing kind of like a part of being, uh, you know, in a big girl job now is managing, of course. Um, so I'm making sure sort of everybody's on the same page from A to Z. So, you know, it starts with basically that call with the sponsor, figuring out what they want to do. And then I talk to the lab team. So those are the people that actually have, you know, hands in the lab that do the day to day. Um, they're the ones that are going to be doing the cell culture, creating the mouse models. Um, doing the injections, doing the imaging, um, doing the necropsy so they can, you know, quantitatively assess the uptake of that radio tracer in animals. So this is like a typical de decision tree of STEM students, right? And I guess I should have used STEAM. Apologies for that. <laughs> this is actually, um, I forgot to update this slide. But um, I think a lot of people, they decide what they want to do. Um, if you want to get an advanced degree, um, chances are, a lot of you are going to go to college. Um, I think it's a safe assumption um, because I think it's it's difficult to go straight into the workforce if you're if you're interested in STEAM. Um, but you know, after that, a lot of you are going to be like, okay, do I want to go to medical school? Do I want to go to graduate school? What does that look like for me? Do I want to go straight into the workforce or do I want to go into service? So um, I kind of want to switch gears a little bit and just give you a little bit of like sort of general advice of um, how to go about this in you know the most productive way possible. Um, and I think it's important to think about, you know, main things of like what matters to you when you're approaching college and or graduate school. So when it comes to science, you know, of course, because that's what I'm assigned to talk about today, what interests you scientifically? Because people always say, you know, the old adage is um, you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you do. And, you know, it's true to some degree, because, of course, um, you know, it, you want to make sure that you end up in a field that interests you scientifically, but it's also something that you actually love doing. Um, but it's, you also wanna make sure that it's something that you're good at. <laughs> so for me, you know, like I think it was pretty random. It's not like I always wanted to be a scientist or specifically like, it's not like I was like, I'm gonna train as a chemist, you know, when I was a kid or like even in high school, really, I was just like, okay, I like science and I'm good at chemistry. So we're gonna start there and that's okay. And you can like a lot of different things, you know, like. It, I think it helps if you, you know, you start young and even just going to attending events like this is like the first step to success to all this stuff. Um, and then moving from there, it's kind of like finding your connections. So where do you know people who are your mentors? And I'll get into mentoring in a little bit too. Um, and then, you know, the personal angle of everything. Do you, do you want to live close to your family? So how important is that to you? Um, you know, I'm from CNY, I'm from central New York, and I've never gone, I've never lived far enough away from my family where I couldn't like drive to get home. And that was not necessarily the most important consideration, but it was a consideration that ultimately ended up happening. And um, I don't think I'll ever, you know, like move halfway around the world. Um, I do like being close to my family. Um, and of course, like that comes down to like passion versus placement. Like, where do you see yourself ending up? And like, where where will the job take you? So like, for example, the company that I work for is based in Boston. And the only reason, you know, why I was hired for a job that I can work remotely is uh, because of COVID. But at the same time, um, the way that my job is structured I, is it doesn't actually entail hands in the lab. So I don't really physically need to be there in order to do my job well. So um, that's like the case for a lot of people, you know, sort of in the more corporate world. But um, a lot of times when you're doing science, that's not necessarily the case. So how to choose an effective mentor. So a mentor um, can be, you know, whatever you need it to be. But importantly, you want to make sure that you have a good relationship with that person, you know, and I think that um, it's hard to kind of exactly define what that is for you, because I think it's all about someone 
that you can vibe with um, in the sense where you want to make sure that they can inspire you um, and also lead you in the right direction, you know, and help you with that training and development. So like, for example, when I was a graduate student, I had, you know, different mentors back then because they taught me how to do research, right? So that's kind of like how I learned it. Like I had older graduate students in the lab before they left, they taught me, they showed me the ropes, you know, and they were also able, because they were, you know, a step ahead of me, they were able to give me like career advice along the way. And, um, you know, I think it's important to have, um, to never stop being mentored. You know what I mean? Even like people that are really well established, like in the field, they still have mentors. It's, it's important to have someone you know, um, steps above you uh, professionally that can like train you to, to be the best that you can be and to, you know, just to give you advice on the next steps. So, um, you know, you might be like, okay, well, what do I do? Like, what's the first thing that I do? What's an effective protocol for career planning? Well, you know, I mean, there are a lot of different things you can do, but, you know, there's a more systematic way of looking at it. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you can just apply for jobs and that likely might not get you very far. Maybe it will, maybe I, it, you know, it all depends on you, but I think a couple things that are good to do are to do like an honest self-assessment um, and also do like a deep dive and figure out like what your skills are and how you can develop them further. And then also do a more productive career um, exploration. So I'll get into all of those. So a self-assessment <laughs> is an interesting thing and uh, I like to teach people this, especially when I uh, get into mentoring, sort of like the, the first thing that people can do um, to sort of like figure out what their needs and goals are is to do a SWOT analysis. <laughs> so it sounds, you know, intimidating, but it's, it's not. It's basically what SWOT stands for is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So let's say for an example, strengths. Um, I am good at public speaking you know, weaknesses. Uh, sometimes I'm, I can be too focused on one task where it can be, it can take me into a time sink or like a, you know, a time waster. Um, opportunities. Um, I'm trying to think for an example, uh, when I was in my postdoc, a, a good opportunity for me would be like to apply for a grant. Um, and a threat um, sounds more daunting than it is, but a threat, an example of a threat is like, what is keeping you from pursuing that opportunity? So for example, if I was early on in my postdoc and I wasn't that experienced with grant writing, right? Um, I need help. So if I have a really busy PI or if like my boss can't help me or I can't find the appropriate kind of people um, to, you know, to help me be successful or to teach me how to do this, then that could be, you know, a threat to my success. So I think that this is a good way to sort of like sit down and be like, okay, this is what I'm good at. This is where I need work. This is, you know, what I can go do and what's in my way. And then you can sort of go from there. And you know, there's a there's a hierarchy. <laughs> I always love this is one of my favorite slides um, that I present at, at things like this because I, I think it's really important for people to like really sit down and realize what this means. Um, and basically, when you're looking for careers or really d doing anything, right? There's there's a sort of a trajectory in terms of like how much energy does it take, but how much impact does it have? So like a Google search is a good example takes little energy, but it's not going to have a lot of impact, right? You know, attending career seminars. So doing something sort of like this, or even attending networking events, it has still, you know, a low to medium energy bar, but it can be pretty impactful, right? Because you can meet a lot of people doing these kinds of things that might inspire you. Um, something that's a little bit step further is conducting an informational interview. So what does that mean? Reach out to people and, you know, ask them, to grab a cup of coffee or to have a phone call or to get on Zoom for like a half an hour. Just, you know, the more you talk to people and the more you learn about their careers and their lives, you'll realize like, okay, that sounds cool. Maybe that's something that I want to do. Or like, mm, maybe that's not for me, you know? And then I think you might be able to like sort of dial down like what you want to figure out, like what you want to go to college for, what you would want to major in, what you might want to do like an internship in or something like that. And uh, volunteering is a good example of something, you know, that takes a lot of energy, but it can have, you know, a really high impact as well, depending on what that looks like for you. And then developing your skills. So if you want to learn how to do something, you know, there are a couple of different ways to do it. 
to take a course, you know, we have the internet at our fingertips. <laughs> um, it's, you know, something that, uh, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people got into it during the whole uh, quarantine phase for sure. Um, taking courses online. Um, it's, I'll admit it's, it's not so easy for me. You know, I, I prefer, you know, sort of in-person um, social things. So it, it can be, it's, it's not for everybody. It can be tough. Um, another sort of example is volunteering. Again, it can, you know, be high energy, but also really high reward. And then also um, doing internships. So, you know, actually like sort of more formally um, shadowing someone and like learning new skills. And, you know, one of the more important things that I want to leave you with is to remember the people you meet along the way, right? So um, I think like this is a good example of, you know, uh, Ishita, for example, is involved in this, uh, putting together on this whole STEAM week. And uh, I met her through the New York Academy of Sciences and she asked me to do this after. She's like, oh, like maybe like Kelly would be a good person for this. Like, that's great. <laughs> you know, like networking is really your best friend. And like the more you do, the more people you meet. And I think it's really important to take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. Um, and then when, when in doubt, you know, you can do a self-assessment and figure out like, you know, where the gaps are and like kind of what you want to improve. Um, but I think that this is like a funny little comic here because basically uh, what this shows is your, your academic genealogy. You're always going to have, you know, I joke when I see people at conferences because we had the same um, PhD advisor um, or we went to the same undergrad, but we like never overlapped, right? But like you have that connection with people and even just, you know, using that connection in order to like basically network and, you know, meet more people and that person can introduce you to the, this person and, and whatnot. And just, it starts the whole train and it's really important. And I think that like building those relationships is really what makes you successful. Um, so the take home messages from all this is that everything takes a lot of time and training. So um, particularly in science, that might be, that can be not necessarily a roadblock, but it can be a little bit um, discouraging for people. Um, as I mentioned, I, I did a lot of training. You know, I had to, I went to college, I went to graduate school, I did a postdoc, and now I finally have like a big girl job. And that's not, it's not always that linear. You don't always have to do a postdoc. You don't even have to necessarily go to graduate school. You could also, you can work in science and not go to college. It's not impossible. It's just the, the more opportunities of you um, to have like more independence and control over like what you want to do for your career does increase the more higher education that you get because everything takes time and training. You can think of a postdoc as sort of like the for those of you that are interested in medical school, the residency of research, right? So it's kind of like a, it's something that you, you just do to get more training because like, you're not going to be able to, I wouldn't have been able to do the job that I do now five years ago. Like, did I need to do a postdoc for five whole years? Maybe not, but I couldn't have done this straight out of PhD for sure. No. Um, and another take home message I want you all to do uh, you know, take from this is to figure out something that you love and that you're also good at. <laughs> and, you know, of course that's going to take time. You're all young, <laughs> you know, um, doing an honest self-assessment can really help you figure out what that might be. Um, another kind of plug for professional development that I think is important is look up what an individual development plan is. And it's something that will basically really force you to list out your goals. Um, and, you know, follow up with those who participate in STEAM week. You know, um, you're more than welcome to add me on LinkedIn or um, the organizers of this can provide my contact information. Like you feel free to email me after um, if you want to chat or, you know, learn more about my trajectory or if you need advice on something, I'm more than happy to help any one of you. Yeah, so thanks for listening. And so I wanted to leave the last uh, 15 minutes for any questions that any of you may have. Yeah, so we actually do have quite a few that I'm going to try right. to get as much as we can get. I think Should I stop there, sharing? Um, I think there was actually one person who wanted to ask about oh, okay. a slide. So cool. I think towards the beginning, so before the mouse imaging slide. Oh, oh sorry, my <laughs> poster stuck to my water glass. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, where am I going? Um, I think it was back to before the mouse imaging slide. Okay. Cool. There was... I think someone was uh, confused on the abbreviations. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this one? Or, yeah, I think it was this one. I'm not sure. They said, or someone asked about the 
abbreviations on the slides. I think those are it. Is it oh, this one? It was this one. Yeah, so it was this one. Okay. So yeah, so I didn't I didn't go through these because I didn't want to uh, dive too deep into it. But basically, um, what I'm showing is uh, so Mick is a the name of a protein. Um, I didn't I didn't edit these to these uh, schemes to make them simpler. <laughs> I probably should have in hindsight. Um, but basically, what this is showing what this is showing is um, when you have a low copy number of Mick, you're gonna have a low copy number of this protein that's downstream, and this is transferrin receptor, and um, you're going to have low transferrin receptor expression on the surface of cells. So this is a cytosol, this is an extracellular space. And if you radio label transferrin, that will attach to that transferrin receptor on the surface of the cell. And what I'm showing here is in the context of cancer, you're going to have a really high expression, uncontrollable expression of that MYC protein. And therefore that's going to trigger basically the whole um, type of trajectory in the sense where you're going to get that overexpression of that and more uptake of that targeted radio tracer on the surface of cells. Thank you. And yeah. all right, there's, oh, okay. I think I'll just start off with whatever I have on the list. Okay. Um, so what would, what do you think would be the best part of your job? The best part of my job? I love planning studies. <laughs> it's just, it's really satisfying to, you know, and also I would say, even though I'm, I'm very new at my job, so I haven't really been able to fully lead this because I'm still in training mode, but really delivering like a fully finished, like really nicely put together, like report of data, like to the sponsor and being like, yes, this is what we did. Like, this is what makes sense. You know, like, let's talk about science. It's just, I don't know that I guess the the planning and also like sort of like the the reward at the end of the study <laughs> and basically in in the sense of like really really neatly organized data presented to the sponsor I think is the best part of my job yeah that sounds so cool <laughs> and then also people were asking about um do you have any tips on getting internships and about which grade should you start looking for them yeah so um I mean that depends on what you want to do are you all California based? We are California based. You are California. Okay. Yes. So yeah. So I mean, it depends. You can just like look up things really in your area. I mean, I'm trying to think of like an example at my current job. I don't know if we would take high school students, but at where I used to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they do take summer internships of high school aged kids actually. Um, so I would just look up anything that like might be in your area. Um, I think it helps to maybe know, you know, some older people that are like in that, like maybe like work at a college or like maybe like someone has like a parent that works at a college and they might have more information on something like that. And you can find out like sort of what exists in your community um, because you can start as young as they'll take you, <laughs> you know, because I think that like New York City is also a special place, right? Because they, I think, um, they do, like, I, I haven't done any specific, like, outreach, but I know that there are programs that exist that do um, there as well. And I'm sure they are in parts of California as well. Thank you for the information. And so I think someone asked if you could elaborate on how to get paid for going to graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is an important one. And I, I want to uh, sort of, before I talk about this, it comes with the caveat that a PhD is not always free. <laughs> this is like specific to um, like the, the life and the hard sciences. Basically, if you go to grad school for um, biology, chemistry, physics, things like that. But I know like a lot of people that if you have to get like a doctorate in a lot of medical fields, like, well, of course, you know, an MD isn't free unless you get a full ride or something like that. But like a doctorate in nursing or something like that, you usually have to pay for something like that. But typically research degrees, um, are they're involved in the sense where you, if you get accepted into the program, you have like protected time where you will be offered like a teaching assistantship. Um, and if that doesn't exist at your school, then usually you, the only people that will be allowed to take students. So like professors that will actually have a lab and a functioning lab, they have to have funding in order to take you because they have to be able to pay you in order to do that. And the school will work with you and make sure that like you get paid either like from a grant or from a teaching assistantship or sort of separate uh, external research assistantships. So it's a whole 
you know, it's a whole kind of complicated world, but you know, when it, when it comes down to the time of actually, <laughs> you know, applying, remember me and reach out and I'm happy to get into more specifics. Cause it's, the problem is, is that it's different for every program, but you, it should be real <laughs> for like any like research degree in sciences. Oh, wow. Oh, imagine being it's so complicated. <laughs> um, all right, I think I had another question. Um, so what did you guys did you have to have to get your job? Uh, what, what? Oh, how, like what degrees did you have to get in order um, for you I, to be a director? Yeah, so I have a, a PhD in chemistry. And um, yeah, so like I said, I, I don't think that I, I, not everybody needs to do um, a postdoctoral fellowship to go into pharma. It's not necessarily a requirement. Um, it, it all depends, but for me, like I felt like I was going to benefit and I did benefit from additional training. So like, I kind of call it, like I said, um, during the presentation, like the residency of research. So it's sort of like a, like after you go to medical school, you don't just get to jump in and be a doctor, right? Like you're not like in charge of stuff. <laughs> like you get to like, of course, practice medicine, but it's not like you're the one, you're not the attending. You know, if anybody watches any doctor shows, you know that there is like some kind of like hierarchy in it you know? So like, I'm able to be uh, like a study director because I have, you know, five years plus the four years of grad school, like under my belt um, as experience. Yeah, I guess um, over the course of these years of experience, what was the funniest thing that happened during your job? The funnest thing that happened or funniest like, or funny. It says, what, what's one funny thing that happened during your job? funny thing that happened during my job like my current job um or I would so assume new? so I think oh I'm okay really yeah so what's one funny thing that happened well actually I mean a funny thing that happened is I actually ended up working um at the same company that one of my former colleagues used to work at so now I like it's almost like the gang's back together and I have a very good friend that I work with now and we use slack a lot um I don't know if you guys know what that is but it's, it's basically like a messaging service and we, we use it sort of like in our jobs to like get in touch with someone really quick if you don't want to send an email or like even you can share documents and do like a lot of stuff through it and it's just like fun to like it's just funny to have that friend <laughs> to kind of chat with every day because we were we were good friends when he was also a postdoc at Sloan Kettering. So. Yeah. Another one someone said that uh, how do you develop your public speaking skills? And this person noted that your presentation was really good and she enjoyed it very much. Oh, thank you so much. That's really kind. Um, and honestly, practice. <laughs> so I got a lot of practice over the years. I think in graduate school, my uh, boss used to make us do sort of a formal presentation every time we had to give group meaning. And uh, during my postdoc, it was actually a little bit less formal, but you still had to present data all the time. And, you know, if you travel a lot and go to conferences, you know, I have about 10 years of that, <laughs> you know, experience. And so you, you give talks, you, you do you present posters and, you know, it really just comes with time, but yeah, the more, the more you practice, the more you uh, get better at it. Yes. So my private message she and saying, join the speech and debate club. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And so I guess um, we have a few, I think one or two more. So what would you think are the top five questions for your field? Top five questions? Oh, like sorry, that's a, top five colleges. Oh, colleges. Oh, colleges. Uh, whew, that's tough. Cause I actually did not go to undergrad specifically for radiochemistry or molecular imaging, but I can give you places that I know of that do have undergraduate programs as well that come to mind. Um, well, you guys are in California, Stanford's really good. <laughs> Stanford has one of the best, you know, molecular imaging programs in the world, really. Uh, and it's, they, of course they, they do take undergrads for research there. Um, I would say UC Davis is also really good. Um, and uh, UCSF also has imaging. Um, so those are a couple that come to mind on the West Coast, uh, in the Northeast, I'm trying to think all the New York schools I'm thinking of, well, Hunter College actually has um, radiochemistry 
and imaging. Um, and a lot of times they can partner with uh, Sloan or Cornell, but I don't know if I would recommend it there necessarily for undergrad. Um, I think it's a good place to do uh, higher training actually, um, because then you can be, you can definitely do research at a, a partner institution in the city. And um, I'm trying to think imaging in the US. Pittsburgh has a pretty good um, chemistry and they also have imaging capabilities there as well, I would say. It's the University of Pittsburgh. But yeah, you can look for really anywhere that has like a universities that have both undergraduate programs, but also ones that have, um, you know, people that are involved in molecular imaging research as well. Okay, and so last question of today, I'm sorry for everyone that I don't think we got through everything, but if you could tell uh, one piece of advice to your high school self, what do you think it would be? <laughs> do more stuff like this. Really, you guys are doing great, <laughs> it, truly, because I, you know, in high school, it's not, it's not that the opportunities necessarily weren't there, but I wasn't seeking them out. So I think that, you know, I, I turned out okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've had a successful trajectory, you know, it, for the most part, but I think that, um, you know, the younger you start, the more potential you have. So, you know. Great work <laughs> to everyone that attended and organized this. You're, you're all killing it. So. Uh, well, with that being said, I would like to thank you, Ms. Kelly Henry, for joining us today and for giving this lovely webinar. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.